Native people. Native culture. Native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international Native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier Native voice in Native programming. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the With Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello, welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native News and Native Information. On today's program, we have part two of Nuwixik, the Northern Village. We also travel to Prince William Sound for the reburial of remains that have been away from their home for 30 years. 1996 Alaska Federation of Natives Convention just ended. We have news and information on that convention. Here's Gary Fife. With Native News Across the Nation, I'll be back right after that, so don't go away. This is Native News Across the Nation. I'm Gary Fife. Alaska's largest gathering of Native peoples has been going on in Anchorage this week. The Alaska Federation of Natives is meeting for the 30th time and commemorating that occasion. On their political agenda, the AFN discussed developing a new Native omnibus bill which would be designed to give Natives more self-determination over their lands and affairs. The AFN delegates also tackled a range of issues from the controversial topic of subsistence hunting and fishing to endorsement of political candidates. The world of native broadcast communications has gotten a little bit bigger recently. In Anchorage, a new urban native radio station has finally gotten on the air after a year's delay. The KNBA began its broadcast presence by airing start to finish coverage of the Alaska Federation of Native Convention. And in Montana, the Fort Belknap tribe is planning to go on air with their station on October 29th. The station's call letters, KGVA, are taken from the tribes who live on that reservation and stand for the Grovan and Assiniboine tribes. For decades, passengers on cruise ships at Niagara Falls have been told a tale of a maiden sent over the falls in a canoe as a human sacrifice. That old and false tale will no longer be told. Under pressure from local tribal leaders this past month, the story which depicts local tribes as savages will no longer be told by the boat's guides. The Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin is trying to provide health insurance for every tribal member. Under their proposal, there would be no premiums to be paid by tribal members and coverage would extend from birth to age 60. If approved by the tribal legislature, the program would be paid for by various tribal enterprises. We'd like to thank all of you who have begun sending us your news and information and your videos for our program. We certainly appreciate that. We're going to tell you how to do it, and I'll be right back after this. Contact Heartbeat Alaska with your news. Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. That's Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. Or give us a call at 1-907-563-7440 or fax us at 1-907-563-9309. Heartbeat Alaska, your news is our news. Supporters of imprisoned Native activist Leonard Peltier just refused to give up. 
Despite legal setbacks over the past year, American Indian movement activist Dennis Banks and noted singer and entertainer Floyd Red Crow Westerman will begin a new national tour calling it the Bring Peltier Home Christmas Clemency Tour. It starts in San Francisco November 30th and winds up in Chicago on December 23rd. Peltier has spent more than 20 years in federal prison in connection with the deaths of two FBI agents. Wilma Mankiller, the popular former principal chief of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, has survived her six-month battle against cancer. Mankiller is now in Oklahoma, where she plans to volunteer for a local women's shelter and produce educational videos on cancer detection. She's also facing a lawsuit by the current administration of the tribe. They're charging she gave too much severance pay to staff members who worked for her during her administration. In California, members of the Pomo tribe want to change the name of a local landmark near the famous Highway 101. Natives say the current name, Squaw Rock, is highly offensive and the word squaw is a historical reference to a native woman's genitals. Tribal members have called the landmark South Mountain, or they referred to it as Frog Rock Woman. And finally, musical artist and entertainer Buffy St. Marie has branched out into a new form of art. The Canadian star is exhibiting a new form of computer-generated material art using digital, uh, digital computers and native themes. St. Marie's exhibition, called Painting with Light, combines traditional images with modern ones through her computer's stylus and pad. She says some of the advantages to using computer art is the availability of 16 million colors and no cleanup. This is Native News Across the Nation. I'm Gary Fife, and this is Heartbeat Alaska, and back to Jeannie and more of our program. Thanks, Gary. In the 1930s, a joint Danish and American expedition traveled to Prince William Sound here in Alaska. They collected native oral histories, artifacts, and human remains. After the expedition was over, the remains were placed in the University of Washington, the University of Pennsylvania, and the National Museum of Denmark. Well, 30 years later, the remains of the ancient ones are finally home. The efforts to return the remains to their original home began 12 years ago when John Johnson of Chugach Heritage Foundation contacted the Danish National Museum and secured permission to publish old stories that were recorded during the 1930 expedition. In Cordova, Alaska, a memorial was held at the Russian Orthodox Church for the return of the remains from Denmark. The remains were blessed with holy water that was sprinkled from a small bundle of evergreen branches tied together. The ancient ones were treated with dignity and respect, as if they had just died the day before. Later, in the darkness of a lunar eclipse, emerging from the clouds above Eak Lake, a small group of people built a fire near the old cemetery on the shores of the lake. Into the fire, tobacco and a plate of food was offered to the spirits of their ancestors. The following frosty morning was cold and clear as a group departed in calm waters in a fishing boat to the ancient village site where their ancestors were once again laid to rest for eternity. The first burial location was at an old Chugach village that was attacked by a warring tribe from southeast Alaska in 1805. This attack resulted in all the villages of Prince William Sound joining together and annihilating the intruding warriors. At this village, male and female adults in their 20s and 50s were reburied. Others were reburied at the next village site, a location well protected from winter storms. The remains of a young woman and a child were placed back home in a dry rock overhang. Directly above the burials on the cliff walls were red paintings or pictographs, which seemed to represent a faceless woman with long braids giving birth. Other images appeared to resemble a killer whale and an expressionless face. 
it is reported that these types of red painting were made from blood, red ochre, and a seal oil mix. The last stop was the burial grounds of the shallow water people. Here they placed a special 21-year-old mummified woman back in her rock tomb, which commanded a view of the ocean waters. In the days of old, one could imagine the spirit of this young lady's grave guarding a migration corridor where kayaks and canoes would travel the Prince William Sound to the open waters of the Gulf of Alaska. The remains of the ancient ones are now back at home. Their prehistoric villages and burial grounds are the foundations of the present-day cultural existence. They're places of strength and power, a power of an unknown force that must be treated with dignity and respect until the rivers flow no more and the sun ceases to shine. <laughs> Thank you so much. EAC Corporation, Chugach Heritage Foundation, Monica Rydell, John Johnson, and everyone else that was involved in the reburial of the human remains and getting the video to Heartbeat, Alaska. Travel with me now to Nuwixik, Alaska, a beautiful little village in the North Slope, a village that may be facing big changes in their future. Oil was discovered right next door. Welcome to Nuwixik, Alaska, Heartbeat. This is... Uh what we call our subsistence uh, ice fishing on today. Last week in Heartbeat, Alaska, we visited with residents of Nuitsik. They shared their thoughts on the biggest oil field discovered in Alaska since 1988, six miles away from their village. If there's an oil field in the river system here, it would have a divest, it would have a very uh, heavily impact on the, on the fish that we depend on, so uh, we're, we're hoping that it's a sound environmental uh, development. We should come to that. Uh, the majority of our villages are heavily depend on the river for fishing, and as well as hunting. So I, I hope that we don't have an oil field like like, uh, like they have in novelties. So we're hoping it's a sound development, uh, responsible development we're looking for. The Wixick, Alaska are facing inevitable change in their lives. With oil development a few years away, they are preparing for this change. On one hand, the village has begun an internship for students to work with the village corporation, a chance to learn the business world. While on the other hand, the schools have included instruction from elders, exposure to traditional knowledge. The elders lunch with the youth on a regular basis. The children enjoy the elders with them, and it's become commonplace. The elders offer stability in a world that considers the most basic services as luxuries. The North Slope Borough provides electricity and delivers water from a freshwater lagoon at a minimal cost. Free trash and sewage pickup services are also provided by the borough. Yet the community's sewage system is honey buckets. There is a laundromat available in town. And the health clinic is staffed by community health aides and is open each day and is available 24 hours a day for emergencies. Nuixic has a public safety building and a fire station equipped with fire engines and an ambulance. The village also has a public transit system. Communications include phones, mail, public radio, and cable TV. The local store supplies groceries and clothing, first aid supplies, hardware, camera film, and sporting goods. Yet amidst all this, 
the people still live off the land. Mark Bergman, principal of Nuiksik Trapper School, finds life harsh in Nuiksik, yet very rewarding. Of course, very flat. There is not a lot of physical relief north of the Brooks Range, but it's really an interesting place to travel in. Um, we travel a lot around here. We move through the countryside and have a good time with it. Caribou are basically pretty plentiful. But trying to connect with the rest of the world in a physical, real-time way is hard for these students. And then when they go off to college, that's a difficult adjustment for them. So that's one of the things that, you know, that we anticipate trying, we're, we're trying to work out ways to help kids, children through that. You know, how, how do we help you connect with the world so that when you get down to college, you, the adjustment isn't so extreme that you want to turn right around and come back home. have an excellent educational setting. Up-to-date telecommunications, small size classrooms, modern facilities. Yet when they go home, more than likely the family freezer is full of fish, caribou, and whale. Their parents probably speak Inupiaq, their native tongue. With oil comes change, and people, and jobs, roads, and vehicles. Yes, life will change in Nuiksik. Oil will bring change. Yet Nuiksik, Alaska is determined to remind the outside world that this is their home. Please be respectful. Be mindful of the land. The land is their life. Blue. My name's Johnny Pollock. I'm from Northern Alaska. Blue. Me too. Oh, oh, I have my birthday today. Whoa. That's hot. so much Dale Stotts and Ukpiavik Inupiaq Corporation out of Barrow, Alaska and Kupik Village Corporation from Nuiksik. We appreciate your support of Heartbeat Alaska and your support in making that story possible. Welcome to AFN. My name is Charlie Brower. This is my wife Rebecca and we watch Heartbeat Alaska every Sunday. Hi, my name is Chris Grant. I'm the uh, chief of Native Village of Tanana and I watch uh, Gina Green all the time. Or Heartbeat Alaska. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul Aaron. I'm from Canada, and uh, I'm the Chief's cousin, and we're big fans of Heartbeat Alaska. Hi, we watch Heartbeat Alaska, and we're glad you do too. I'm from Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm, I'm Anita Okumaila, and I don't miss Heartbeat. Bye. I'm Tina Carlson from Chignik Bay. I'm Judy Carlson, Tina's daughter from Chignik Bay. I'm Ma Tasha too. <laughs> I'm Mika Carlson, I'm from Chignik Bay. Barbara O'Diamond, Chignik Lake. Arlene Carlson, Colton, Chignik Bay. Charles O'Diamond, Chignik Lake. Claudia Carlson, Chignik Bay. Gary Fine, Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> We're from Delta Junction, Alaska. Welcome to Heartbeat, Alaska. Yay! Hi, my name is Skeeter Jefferson. I'm from Wisconsin View, Alaska, and I love the music on Heartbeat, Alaska.
Here in Anchorage, the 1996 annual Alaska Federation Convention just ended this past weekend. Along with the convention, many activities were planned, like this one. Big and big and big cut to uh, education departments. Your hands up for Casey Gross. You want to, you want her as your representative? The Elders and Youth Conference, held days before the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention, brought together new ideas with the wisdom of elders. It was an opportunity to hear the youth and to learn from the experienced ones. And probably the most important thing they said is that uh, Alaska Natives did not, were not given land, were not given money with the settlement. That the Alaska Natives, in fact, kept 40 million acres and more or less agreed to be paid $3 an acre for the rest. So it's the youth have to know that they were not given something for nothing. That, in fact, they're the ones that gave a lot. So, And then John Burbage's point is that you must never forget that because you would lose pride. We here at Heartbeat Alaska have an exciting project underway. We'll be giving presents to the natives on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and also to our native brothers and sisters on the Navajo Nation Reservation. Please send your gift for an adult, male, female, or child, boy or girl, to Heartbeat Alaska, area code 907-563-7440, or Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. I have a feeling this Christmas is going to be a very special one for me, and I'd like to share that specialness with everyone else. If you'd like to help me send a van load of presents down to the Pine Ridge Reservation and to the Navajo Nation, give us a call or just go ahead and send in your gift and we'll make sure that the Native people in those states get those presents for all of us here at Heartbeat Alaska. Have a fabulous week. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless you. Be safe. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.